When you think of the fire of the Lord falling, what do you think of in the Bible? Elijah, yeah, you think of Elijah, don't you? You know, at first, in thinking about it, you might think that's the only time that happened. But actually, it happened multiple times in the Bible. We're going to look at a time right here in Second Chronicles, in chapter number 7, in just a minute. The fire of God falls. Now, you can think about Pentecost, the cloven tongues of fire comes down on them. But it's interesting, as I was studying this passage, that the fire of the Lord falls here. Now, Solomon is prayed a prayer, and it's quite a prayer. Can you imagine the king, the great king Solomon, get down on his knees in front of all the people? The Bible says he lifts his hands up like this and begins his prayer. And the prayer is chapter 6, most of the chapter. He's praying to God. Quite a prayer. If you look at just a little bit of it, the Bible tells in verse number uh, um, 12, And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. For Solomon made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high and had it set in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. Now you might think, big deal. But if the king, and this is the great king of Israel, I mean, there was no one like Solomon as far as peace. I mean, I know David was a great king, but he brought a lot of that. But his borders extended, his wealth increased. I mean, Solomon was as Nebuchadnezzar would be as we're studying in Habakkuk. I mean, he was the uh, ruler of all the world as far as most powerful without question. And Solomon, in front of all the people, the king gets down on his knees. No, no king kneels before Solomon. He gets down on his knees in this dedication of the temple. Again, I mentioned a few minutes ago about submission. And the reason we don't want to do that is one big reason is pride, right? Yeah, well, preacher, this and that, but you don't know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with pride. It's all about me, what I have going on. What about the Lord? Where's the Lord? Here's Solomon. In front of all his people, he gets down and says, I want you to know something. It's all about him. He kneels, prays quite a prayer. Notice verse 29, chapter 6. He says, Then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people, Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according to all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways, so long as thy li they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Moreover, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people, Israel, but has come from a far country, for thy great name's sake, and thy mighty hand, and thy stretched out arm, if they come and pray in this house, then hear thou from heaven even from thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee, as doth thy people Israel, and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Quite a prayer. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Look what happens. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, what's the next phrase? Say it. What is it? The fire came down from heaven. Chapter 7, 2 Chronicles, the Old Testament there, verse 1. And consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. Would to God that would happen this morning. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement. And what? Worshipped. And praised the Lord, saying, For He is good. Oh, think of it. God showed up. He's heard our prayer. For He is good. For His mercy Endure forever. But we don't, we don't deserve God to care about us at all. 
We deserve hell is what we deserve. And God to care and God to work and God to show up in their lives. He's good. And what mercy that he would care about us. Oh, but I want you to notice the response there of the people. Do you see it? They saw the glory and the power of the Lord, the glory so much they couldn't even come into the house of God. The priest even had to get out. His, his glory is so powerful, terrible, wonderful, magnificent, the awe of it. And notice the response. They bowed themselves. Their faces to the ground and upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord. Notice, please, God connects worship here to true revival. Worship, true worship to revival. I mean, here we're going to talk about the most famous revival verse in the Bible, as far as Christians would know. Verse 14 in just a minute. But it began, this, all is, this chapter begins with worshiping God as he shows up. Even the devil knows this. Uh, this is what he does not want you to give yourself to. What I preached last Sunday or two, two Sundays ago now. What did he talk about? We talked about that one thing needful. The great must of every Christian in private worship of the Lord every day. You see the response. It's the same throughout the Bible, by the way, when God shows up. Uh, study Isaiah chapter 6. When the prophet sees the Lord high and lifted up and the smoke of the, and the, and the house there, the Bible says, and the train filled the temple and the place shook, Isaiah falls to his face and worships. He worships God. In Revelation, we see the great worship services in heaven. Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and let me read a couple of verses from there, Revelation 4, 9 to 11. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. For thy pleasure they are and were created. Then Revelation 5, we see again worship. And when he had taken the book, no one can open this book. And the prophet's weeping, oh, no one can open the book. And the angel says, hold on, it's okay. There's someone that can open the book. This lamb steps forward as had been slain. And the Bible says in verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayer of the saints. And so worship is connected, we find, with worth. Or worthship, as we say, that is worthy. Worthy. Maybe... You're not feeling good, or maybe you're tired, or maybe you've had a bad week, or maybe you've had a bad month, or maybe whatever. But if certain people in your life, maybe one of your parents, maybe a grandparent, uh, maybe someone you really respect walks into your home, or walks into your place of work, or walks into your life that day, there's something that changes because they're worthy, the worthship, the worth you've placed on that person for you to be, forget about self and everything is concerned about that person. That's what the Lord does in our lives as we see him. See, it doesn't matter what's going on with all the people's lives. Here's a whole nation. But when God showed up and his glory filled the place and they saw the power of God, there's only one response. They got down and bowed and worshiped the Lord for he is worthy. And that's what you and I need every day. To forget self. Oh, hallelujah. Help us, Lord, to get rid of self. Our own pride, that's easy to say. It's a lot harder to do. You find it's always submission to the one you worship. Submission. This worship, this desire, this submission that he alone would get all the glory. And I would be one giving him the glory. We see them taking the crowns of Revelation 4 and 5 and cast them at his, at his feet. That's what you and I will do, Lord willing. The crowns that we receive for serving him. After salvation, uh, things that we see that God says we can be rewarded at the Bema seat, the reward seat. Not so we'll get glory, but so that we'll give to Him all the glory because He alone is worthy of that glory, isn't He? Isn't He? Absolutely He is. No question about it. 
And God wants you and me to live that way now. That he alone is worthy of that worship. Submission. Why in our day are Christians like they are? Why, why so often they seem to be cold, indifferent about uh, the things we ought to be weeping over. Jesus would stand and weep over cities. Weep over people and see people and love them, though he knew they are about to turn his back on them. Yet he cared, he loved, he, he wept, he was concerned, there was a heart. Why are we so cold so often and so worldly so often? And why so powerless, it seems, in our prayer and walk? Why do people not submit to God? And I submit to you, it's because they do not know him. For to know him is to immediately fall down in wonder, in love, in praise, and submission. Here's these people. God shows up and immediately they fall down. For he is good. They begin to worship and praise him. He is good. His mercy. Just as there can be no true worship of Jesus until there's total submission to Jesus... There can be no true Christianity until there's total submission. You cannot be Christ-like until self is died to, until we put self to death and allow the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, to live in and through us. It's submission. The Christian life is a yielding life. It's a, it's a laying down of our will and our way and our wants and our desires and our plans. Aren't you glad God's removed a lot of your plans and desires? Boy, what a flop they would have been, but God helped you and you put them aside for His plans that were far better, for His desires, His goals that were something good for us. All we, do is have to, all we have to do is look at the example of Jesus. Jesus we find in constant submission to the Heavenly Father. Even He would say, I don't speak any word except comes from my Father. I don't do any works except under my Father's direction. I mean, every example. I mean, Jesus is God. We believe that. And yet he is showing such an example of submission. Who are we to think we're just going to go out here and do our thing like, like Samson and just get up and we're going to shake ourselves again and expect God to do something? The Lord Jesus didn't even do that. He was completely submissive to the Father. We find in his temptation, Matthew chapter 4, the devil comes and the devil's tempting him. In verse 8 9, it says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Oh, very clever, Satan. Why? <laughs> because you'll serve the one you worship. What good is it to have all the kingdoms of the world if Satan has you? It's interesting. See, the person you worship will control you. Even the devil knows that. And Jesus' response is very revealing. Listen to verse 10, Matthew 4. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The devil didn't say anything about serving him. He just said, I want you to worship me. But the, nev the devil's full of half-truths. Oh, he knew the truth, but he's a deceiver. He said, I don't want you to serve me. I want to say, and I just want you to worship me. But the devil knows whatever you worship, you serve. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 10. Here's our text this morning. I'm going to read six verses here, seven verses, verses 10 to 16. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David, and to Solomon, to Israel, his people. I'll tell you this week, we were glad and merry of heart as God showed his goodness to us and answered prayer the Hoover Church plant and seeing him work and then after Thursday what God did. We're glad and married. That's what these people are. Oh, well, they met with the Lord and God showed up and God's presence is among us. And they're happy about it. Verse 11, Then Solomon finished the house of the Lord and 
the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him. Now, these next few verses, it's the Lord speaking. I've heard thy prayer. Hallelujah. And have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? See, our God's a God worth sacrificing for. Read Hebrews 11. You find Abel said, God, my God's a God worth sacrificing for. It cost him his life. But he sacrificed the lamb as God required. My God's a God worth sacrificing for. A house of sacrifice. Verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Oh, what a promise. For now... Have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever? And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Oh, so much in this passage. I'm going to give you a message this morning entitled, Revival God's Way. Revival God's Way. Let's pray together. Father, we believe that if we're to have revival, it'll be an act of God. But not because you're unwilling and we're trying to start you or get you to do something, but rather because you're waiting on us to obey exactly what you've told us right here. If, my people, then you've promised to do. And Father, would you help us? Oh, Lord, would you help it not be me that stands in the way of revival? And Father, may each one of us, that be our prayer. Lord, I don't want it to be me. Lord, may it not be me that's quenching the Spirit, that grieves the Spirit, that is standing in the way of you doing the work you would want to do here in this place. Father, we know the end of this story and how the temple was destroyed because of the sin of your people. Father, we know that we live in a day and hour where we need reviving again. So we're asking, we're pleading, Lord, that you would help us to be willing to submit, to yield, to worship, to desire that you alone would receive all glory and we would get rid of this stinking pride that prevents us from seeing you at work, prevents us from you allowing you to work in our lives because we're strong. We have need of nothing. And we don't realize, as your word says, that we're naked and Lord, we're diseased and we're sick. Oh, help us. We ask for your spirit to do a work in every heart, please. Help me to share your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I believe Second Chronicles 7 here gives us five truths or Five ingredients for you and me to have biblical revival. Number one, I want you to see God needs a place. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Notice verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be opened and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. So you see the temple here, first of all, underneath a place. God needs a place. You see the temple that Solomon built. Hey, here is a place that God said he'll put his name, and truly that's what happened. Verse 2, the Shekinah glory of God showed up, so much so that they had to exit out of the temple. The priest even, it said in verse 2, they could not enter into the house because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Powerful. It's quite amazing, this temple, you study about it, it took years to build. Now, Solomon's temple was not the same temple we read about in Jesus' day, but we know in Jesus' day, he, remember they thought he was talking about the temple, but he was talking about this temple. 
He said, I'll tear it down in three days, rise it up again. They said, we were 40 and six years building this temple. You're going to build it in three days? Well, they're talking about Herod's temple there. That was the rebuilt temple, right? Nehemiah and Ezra and all these that came back there to rebuild the temple and so on. But Solomon's temple, it took years. And I may not have the exact years, but it was more than 10 years at least. But here's what's interesting. You study about how they built it. There was no sound of a hammer in the temple. No sound of any type of tools, the work being done in the construction of the temple. Everything was constructed off-site. And out of reverence to God, when they carry that piece that they'd finished in, no word was spoken. Not just by them, by anyone in Jerusalem. No word, no sound made. And they laid in place where it went. Everything. Quite amazing to read about. Not only that, inside the temple, I don't know if there's any on the outside, but inside the temple there was 108,000 talents of gold. That's over 1 million pounds of gold. That's quite a place. They say a talent was about 93 pounds, as much as a man could carry. They estimate over 1 million pounds of gold. That was the temple that Solomon built. But that's not the temple where God resides today. Where is God's temple today? Well, secondly, under this, we think God needs a place that we see the temple that salvation bought. There's the temple, temple that Solomon built. Then there's the temple that salvation bought, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? And ye are not your own. But you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. This body is a temple. We just had a lesson in Sunday school about alcohol. No one that's a Bible believer and knows God's word would take alcohol into their body, the temple of God. And it's a mockery. Why is it a mockery? Strong Greek is raging. Who serve to see thereby is not wise. I want to take that God's wisdom. Oh no. Woe to him. There's curse upon people. At last it biteth like an adder, it stingeth like a serpent. It's a trap. It's a snare. We're, we're at the temple of God. And so, the temple that salvation bought, where does the Lord's presence dwell today? That's not in a temple made with hands. Now, I like having a place like this sanctuary, we call it, or this auditorium, where we don't, we don't do all kinds of um, clowning stuff in here and, and uh, carrying on too much. Now, it's just a building. I understand that. But it is nice to have a place where we can come and say, we worship God together here. And there is something special about that. But the honest truth is, this building is just a building. If you come here on, I don't know, Friday night or any, some evening no one's here, you'll just find a building. <laughs> okay? God's presence is brought into this place when you and I come into this place. We that know the Lord, if we've been walking with Him, the Spirit of God is upon us and His Spirit is sensed in the place, not because of this building, but because of His temple. He resides in this place. That's what He said. And so the temple that salvation bought, let me tell you this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, your Savior, then Jesus doesn't live within you and you're not on your way to heaven. He wants you to be. He died so you could be, but the Bible says you're headed to hell without Christ. But he paid your sin debt on Calvary. And though you're a sinner and though you deserve hell, and that's where you would go if you died at this moment, Jesus is still extending mercy and goodness and you could be saved today if you place your faith in Him, repent of your sin and turn to Christ, He'll save you. That's the temple that salvation bought. And when He paid for it on Calvary, He said, What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? And you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. You say, Wow, a million pounds of gold in Solomon's temple. Oh, that's nothing compared to the price that your temple was paid for. Nothing compared to the price that the temple of my body was paid on Calvary. The blood, the precious blood of Christ. It wasn't bought with silver and gold. No, no, the Bible says, but the precious blood of Christ. I don't know. If some con artist could have a little vial and say, this is Jesus' blood it was taken off the cross, taken when he was bleeding and dying, what he could get for it. People would pay dearly, I'm sure. Superstitious people, people that thought there was something to that. I want to tell you, sitting in this room all over, there's people 
whose bodies have been purchased with that blood. Jesus said he'd pay for it. And you're his temple. This is the temple that salvation bought. Can I say this? You want to read about what Jesus did for you and me? Read Psalm 22. Oh, my. What a, what a Savior. What a shepherd. What a price paid to purchase you and I. I want to tell you, he's still receiving sinful men. If you'll come to him today, he'll save you. An invitation just a minute. We want you to come and be saved today. And that's not just what we want. That's what Jesus wants. He said, come unto me. Come unto me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That's death and hell. But have everlasting life right now. God wants to save you. Turn to him. God needs a place. Number two, God needs a problem. <laughs> this is interesting. What? A problem? Well, look at verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. <laughs> what do you mean a problem? Well, it would be far better not to need reviving, wouldn't you say? I mean, if I'm sucking on a cough drop while I preach, and I'm like, I suck it in and I start, I start passing out, falling over, and one of you kind folks came and helped me and gave me the Heimlich or resuscitated me in some way, I'd be revived and I'd be glad about it. <laughs> but I'd be a lot happier if that didn't happen. And I just stayed alive and didn't need a reviving, right? Or maybe you tried to resuscitate me and couldn't get me and finally they came and shocked me back alive. And again, I'd be happy to be revived, but it had been far better not to need it. But why do we need revival? I mean, God gave you life. He, he came into you, didn't he? He's made up his temple. He's, you're his abode. He's come into you. But God knows his people, doesn't he? Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. We're so prone on this bent in this human body on sin. And God knows that we're going to need the spanking of a heavenly father, the chastening. As we continue in sin, that there would come a day when his people were hard, and he tells about it in 2 Timothy 3, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Even God's people would have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. God's people would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They won't want the truth. They won't stand for sound doctrine. And God knew they would need revival. They'd need reviving again. And so he writes this. There has to be a problem. I'm telling you, in America, we have the problem. We're no shortage of problem among God's people, among those that claim the name of Christ. We have problems. I mean, I mean we, we just had this lesson this morning, so it's on my mind about alcohol. There are Southern Baptist churches, churches almost just like this one, that are serving alcohol and allowing alcohol and saying to their people, it's okay to drink alcohol, and yet the Word of God's never changed. It's of the devil. There's no question about that. Every one of us could give a story of some we know that the things that have happened in their lives, your children, your parents, your sister, your brother, because of alcohol, and it would never have happened. And yet God's people are saying it's okay. Amen. Oh, yeah, but well, wine's okay. No, wine's a mocker. It lasts to sting it like an adder. I and mean, we read Proverbs 23 today. You're crazy. And to think Jesus gave alcohol, and they want to give that as a, you're crazy. So this guy got drunk at the wedding in Cana Galilee and slept with another man's wife. And he said, I just was drinking that stuff Jesus was giving out. I don't remember what happened. You're out of your mind to think that. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. You think Jesus gave drink to everybody? The Bible says curse on that person. Habakkuk 2.15. I'm just trying to point out, we need revival. These are God's people saying this kind of foolishness. So God needs a problem, and we have the problem. That's not a problem. <laughs> but God knows us. He gives three problems. First, a drought of rain. If you're a farmer, you live in an agricultural society as they did, nothing's more devastating than no rain. Nothing more serious. And water throughout the Scriptures we find is connected with God's Word in the Bible. We talk about the washing of the water by the word. 
Isaiah 55, 10 to 11, famous verses. Listen, for as rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. See, God compares a drought of rain to a drought of his word. Some of you are in a drought right now in your life. You used to read the Bible. Hey, look up here. You used to read the Bible, but you're not now. You used to get into God's Word, and there was fruit growing as a result of that. But it's not there now. There's a drought happening. It's not because you don't have a Bible, but you're not getting into God's Word. And God's Word's not watering spiritually. There's not food and fruit growing like there once was. He talks about a drought of rain. Food grows where the water flows. You want to see fruit in your life? Get in this book. You'll see fruit grow. God's Word does that. Matthew 22, 29, Jesus said, Ye do err. Why? Not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Jeremiah 8, 9, The wise men are ashamed. They're dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the Word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? (laughs) How can you be a wise man if you've rejected the word of the Lord? Wisdom comes from God. There's no wisdom outside of God and His word. True wisdom. Proverbs 13, 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. You don't want to be destroyed? Hey, old person, young person, you want to be destroyed? Don't despise God's word. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because... Thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. They'd forgotten God's word. Our generation has forgotten God. We've removed God from our schools. We've removed the Ten Commandments. We've removed uh, things. Now they're wanting to remove every edifice. Edifice, there was the word. Edifice, any, any reminder, any cross, anything that makes anyone think of God, they want to remove it from anywhere they can. We all got bent out of shape when they took the Bible and reading the scriptures out of schools. But did you know, mom and dad, dad and mom, did you know it's legal to read the Bible at home? It's legal. You're allowed to read the Bible in your home. See, the worst isn't that they took it out of schools. The worst is we've removed his word from our homes. Oh, there's still a Bible sitting on the coffee table, but nobody opens it. Or rarely. We've taken it out of our pulpits. People don't carry their Bible to church anymore. It's not needed because it's not used. Why bring it? We're not opening it. We're not using it. We're not studying it. And so God's removed his hand of blessing. His hand of protection in our nation. See, God didn't bless America because of the lost people in America. There's always been lost people in America. God blessed our nation because of God's people, because of the Christians, because of the obedience to His Word and the desire to get the gospel to people. That's why God blessed America. Number two, we see another problem, a devouring. He says here in verse 13, Or if I command the locust to devour the land. What's that talking about? The locusts are devouring. It's a devouring of righteousness. Remember Proverbs 14, 34? Righteousness righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. See, today sin is promoted and God is demoted. You're crazy if you believe in God, but if you want to transgender your seven-year-old, this is wonderful. We're out of our minds. There is an insanity that comes with sin. There's no question about that. The locus of sin has been loosed and righteousness is being devoured. Listen to this passage in Isaiah. Tell me if there's a passage of the Bible that describes our American culture better than this. Isaiah 59, 12 to 15. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, 
And judgment is turned away backward. And justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street. And equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. People are living a lie. They speak lies and putting forth lies. And they're praised for doing it. Number three, we see another problem. The damage here. It's damaging even the redeemed. Look about it. It says, or if I send pestilence among who? My people. You see, a damage of the redeemed. My people. Sin is not just affecting the world. Sin is affecting God's people. God's people. Sin is affecting preachers and potential preachers that foul out because of their sin. Sin is affecting Christian homes and Christian school children and Bible college students. And let me tell you, the wolf does not prey on other wolves. The wolf preys on the sheep. I read an interview. I read of an interview. It was an interview with a man who was involved. He was in his late 80s at this point, but when he was 14, he heard Evan Roberts preach and was involved in the Welsh Revival. When the Welsh Revival broke loose, just 14 years old, the meeting places became so filled that they only allowed... Uh, men, adult men, and, or, or boys that are 14 years and up. There wasn't room for women or children. They were, they were so crowded in these meeting places. That would be a good problem to have, wouldn't it? They were so filled. There was no room. He said he was 14 years old. He heard Evan Roberts preach. This elderly man had this Irish accent, and he had to kind of strain to understand what he was saying, but... As he talked about those services and how God began to sweep the country of Wales, he spoke of the changes that began to take place because of revival. The interviewer then asked him this question, and I quote, Sir, what was it like in Wales just before the revival? This pastor listening to it said, I'll never forget his answer. It came so quickly. He said, the people were as hard as flint. Like the rock. Flint. It was hard as flint. This pastor I was listening said, when I heard that response, I lifted my hands and said, hallelujah, there's still hope for revival. Even in America. Because those people were as hard as flint and God brought revival in Wales. God needs a problem. God needs a place. Number three, God needs a people. Verse 14, the Bible said, if my people. You know why Sodom and Gomorrah didn't see revival? God didn't have any people there. God needs a people. Number one, revival is conditioned by an awakened people. An awakened people. See, the word if in verse 14, if my people, if, it indicates There's circumstances that would have to exist in order for it ever to happen. If. If. It's the one factor in the revival equation that is unknown. If, my people. It's the unanswered problem. The question is, will God's people awaken? Will we who are saved... Awake to revival. America is sinking in spiritual poverty, not because of Washington, D.C. or Montgomery here. It's not because of the economy that we're sinking spiritually, but because God's people have not yet awakened. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now... Is our salvation nearer than when we believed? God's saying, we need to wake up. It's time to get out and wake out of sleep. Wickedness is prevalent in our culture, including among Christians. And we as Christians must wake up to God if we're going to have revival. Remember what he said as we read there? He was praying, Lord, if our people would turn and pray to you, would you hear the prayer made in this place? And God responds with a promise. 
He says, I'll be open, verse 15, my eyes be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. But how many Christians aren't praying? We're not asking God to do anything. We're not believing God for anything. God said, I'll hear and answer prayer, call unto me. But we're not calling. See, there has to be an awakened people that recognize, oh Lord, please, we need you. Well, I've got problems. You don't understand what I'm dealing with. That's the problem. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Number two, under this, revival is chosen by an attached people. And not only by a conditioned by an awakened people, but it's chosen by an attached people. Notice verse 14. If my people which are called by my name, attached to the vine, attached to the Lord. The key to revival is not found in governmental leaders. It's not found in some Supreme Court justices or better laws. The key to revival is found in God's people. Those who claim His name. My people that are called by my name. See, God didn't wait for Sodom to change. He waited for ten righteous people to stand up. But they weren't there. It took longer for God to get the preacher to Nineveh than for God to revive a city. It wasn't the wickedness of the people that was the problem. It was the wickedness of God's people. The lack of the righteous. Where there is no vision, people perish. You can apply that verse, but how about when there's no vision of God? When there aren't people seeing God? When there aren't people recognizing what God sees in a world, people around us are perishing. God needs people who are not only awakened, but attached to Him. Listen to Matthew 5, 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt of us is savor, wherewith shall be salt is thenceforth good for nothing, but He cast out and trodden on the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. God has put it in our hands. You're the salt. You're the light. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And one verse later, in verse 11 and 12, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshy lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. But even Peter, as he says, this is what you are, a verse later recognizes that I beg you, abstain from fleshly lusts. Those desires of your flesh will eat you up spiritually. Our selfish pride is destroying our homes, it's destroying our churches, it's destroying our nation, it's destroying ourselves. Listen to Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. You say, well, Pastor, you're uptight about this. That's because every prideful heart is an abomination to God. Well, I'm against these sodomites. I'm against it too because it's a grievance against God, but it's just sin. But they don't know God, but we do. And God says, every prideful heart is an abomination to me. Whoa. We like to categorize sin. We don't mind talking about someone else's sin. Who's ready to talk about my sin and your sin? Who's ready to talk about your sins? Your wicked ways that we must get into and get rid of. According to this, we're coming to that. Oh, I don't want to be the one that stands in the way of revival. God is waiting for each one of us. Does revival tarry because of you? Because of me? Will you be the one who stands in the way of revival? Number four... Fourth truth, the fourth ingredient, God needs a procedure. 
Look at his procedure here. If my people which are called by my name, and he lists things here, take, give attention here. He says, shall humble themselves. Number one, we see a humble contrition. Humility. Have you ever noticed that humility is what we call a DIY project? <laughs> humility is a do-it-yourself project. It's not God's job to humble you. It's God's job to exalt those that will humble themselves. He's promised he would. It's your job to humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. Why? For God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Clothed with humility. See, our selfish pride... It's destroying our homes. It's destroying our churches, our nations, ourselves. Pride. Pride. Mm. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Not only a humble contrition, but we need, secondly, a heavenward calling. Look what he says. Shall humble themselves. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and what? Do you believe God still hears and answers prayer? Man, I'm so excited this week. Uh, maybe you all were right there with me. I trust you were. But I was pleading with God, Lord, where are we going to meet? I want to see your hand in this. I want to know we're not stepping out on our own, but we're hearing God's voice saying, this is what we're to do, and this is the way. Walk in it. And God provided a place miraculously for us to meet in Hoover. It was a miracle. God answers prayer. We're seeking the Lord and desiring Him, and He will. He promised. He's committed Himself to answer that. But how little we pray. He needs a heavenward calling. There is a procedure here. A humbling. By the way, once you humble yourself, you'll pray. The reason we don't pray is we're so full of pride. Well, I don't need God. I get up and do this. I do this every day. Well, who's keeping that heart beating of yours? Who's providing that oxygen? Who's giving you the wherewithal and the wits? You could go crazy like Nebuchadnezzar. Just a moment, God made him go crazy, act like an animal for seven years. You could go crazy too. Russell's got a friend he's been praying for. Just all of a sudden, just it's in a mental war, just went crazy. Hey, that could be you except for God's mercy and grace and help. We need him, but we're so full of pride. See, God's procedure for revival requires humility, but it also requires prayer. It's not the church that's going to bring revival. It's not some message that's going to bring revival. It's not the evangelist that brings revival or some program that brings revival. The Bible says, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Ask, ask, and ye shall receive, he said in Matthew 7, 7. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. 1 John 5.14, along the same lines. James 5.16, the effectual uh, prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the fervent, effectual prayer. Revival comes when God's people pray. Is it simple? Yes. Is it doable? Yes. Hmm. You and I could be part of a revival if we would just pray. Number three, we see in this procedure of God's a heartfelt change. Notice verse 14, and seek my face. Humble themselves, pray, and seek my face. What are you seeking? Honestly, what are you seeking in life? What is it you're after? Boyfriend, girlfriend, a husband, a wife? Promotion, a job, a car, a house. A, what are you seeking? boy from your boss? A certain amount of money in the bank? What are you seeking? Pleasures? God says here that we ought to be seeking His face. I wonder how many of us this week could honestly say, this week I sought God's face. Has the heart 
panted after the water brook, so my soul longed after God this week. Oh, me. See, when we seek selfish desires or worldly acceptance or wrong friends or pleasures, revival cannot come. Can I ask you? If, if, if God brought revival, would you keep seeking Him? Or would you seek fame to write a book about what God did? I want to get on the TV and get an interview about what God did. Or would we keep seeking Him? See, we're seekers of fortune. We're seekers of success. Many people come to church in search of happiness. How many come to church, I would say few, in search of holiness? I want to know God and be more like God. I'm seeking God. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Then an honest confession, he says, and turn from their wicked ways. You know, we can talk about sin all day long as long as someone else is sin. <laughs> we can discuss how much God hates sin. But which specific sins does God hate in your life and my life? Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Pastor, we came in here to get advice. <laughs> We don't want to talk about our sin. Well, God says, turn from... These are God's people. If my people... Yes, God said, in His people, they need to turn from their wicked ways. Now, it might be something outward. It might be drunkenness. It might be pornography. It might be uh, videos and music. It might be things that people know about. But how many times as Christians it's things that we think we keep good and hidden? Our bitterness. Our unforgiveness. Our anger. She's God is waiting for people to be honest about their sins. Wicked ways, plural. You may say, oh, everything's good. I'm good. But God knows how to reveal the dirt when he sheds his light upon it. Listen to Psalm 90, verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I don't do any of those things, and yet we're full of pride. Luke 12, 2, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Neither, therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. Hebrews 4, 13, there, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So let's confess individually our sins this morning. What are your wicked ways in your life? What about my life? Look, God won't forsake you. He'll help you. You call sin, sin. Psalm 51, 17, don't forget, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, that will not despise. And I want you to notice when we will call sin, sin and turn, repent, that's what turn is, repent is, to turn, turn from their wicked ways, Look what will happen then. God gives a promise. There's number five. God gives a promise. When we as God's people follow God's procedure concerning the problem we see in a place called our hearts, His temple, then God gives a promise. Here's His promise. Number one, the promise of a hearing ear. You say, oh, God hears everything. Well, He's God. He knows everything, but He said Time and time again in his word, I will not hear your prayer. I will not listen. You'll seek me, but you will not find me. Strong. Why is that? Because there's a procedure to come to God. If you'll come to revival God's way, then God has the promise. Well, I want the promise. I want all that. Well, me too. You don't get the promise first. It comes first with if. 
my people. Then, now we're at the promise. Then, number one, promise of hearing ear. Has God heard our prayer for revival? And Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto their cry. Honestly, have we turned from our wicked ways? Are we living righteous lives? We humbled ourselves. We seeking Him. Isaiah 65, 24, that it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. Evangelist John Getch said, if we want God to hear our prayers for revival, we must willingly remove from our lives that which is wrong and sinful. He promises to hear the cries of the righteous. He's willing to do something beyond our expectations. Calling to me. And I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Ephesians 3.20, he says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Temple of God. He's willing to do something beyond our expectations, but we must be willing to do what it takes to have God hear our prayers. The promise... That he'll hear, then the promise of a holy eradication. Notice what he says, I will forgive their sin. You know, some people you might worry about, if they knew me, they wouldn't like me anymore. That's probably true for some. But you know, God already does know you. He loves you. He likes you. And he says, I'll promise, I'll forgive you. You come to me, I'll forgive your sin. I'll forgive your sin. I love 1 John 1, 9. What a promise. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all. Don't you like that word all? All unrighteousness. Hallelujah. We all have sin in our lives that makes God sick. You say, well, what do you talk about? I'm not pride. Selfishness. Bitterness. Jealousy. Envy. Covetousness, these are often sins that no one knows about. You weren't drunk and falling out somewhere. Your family isn't in a divorce because of your adultery. It's not something out in the public, but it just as much quenches the Spirit of God. And so we don't have revival. So God can't do these things that He's promising here because we've not come through the procedure. Turn from our wicked ways. Oh, I talk about the sin. There's a lot of sin in our nation. Yeah, but are you willing to talk about your sins with God and make them right? And maybe for you it is something on the outward. God is able to forgive all of them. <laughs> Psalm 103, 12, he says, As far as the east from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. God wants to forgive us far more than we want to be forgiven. Can you imagine that? God wants us to clean house, and He wants to clean house, and He wants a purified people and a, a vessel of honor sanctified and meat for the Master's use. He delights in the process. Do you understand that? Listen to Micah 7, 18. Our God, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of His heritage, He retaineth not His anger forever, because He delighteth in mercy. You understand, we have a God that delighteth in mercy. And He's still extending that if we'll come to Him. He that covereth the sins shall not prosper. He that confesseth and forsaketh them shall find what? Mercy. <laughs> mercy. Oh, I want mercy. It's like the loving father in the story of the prodigal. That father was longing for the boy more than the boy was ever longing for home. When that boy came, the loving father came out to meet him running. Our God, that's a picture of our God. Number three under this, the promise of a healing experience. This is the last thing. And we'll forgive their sin and we'll heal their land. What would bring healing to America? No more racism. <laughs> Give me a break. That's never going to happen. Not without God. Outside the church in history, it's never happened. There's always been, I mean, Egypt enslaved the Hebrews. I mean, there's always been racism. What would heal our land? Oh, if we have this certain president. 
That's what we were told when the Barack Obama took office. Well, now if we have a lady president, what if we get someone transgender? Would that heal our land? Give me a break. That's not going to heal our land. Only God can heal our land. Only God can do that. Because only God can bring healing to any individual. And our nation is made up of people. There is a balm in Gilead. There is healing for the broken people. And we have broken people all over our country. But why would people be like this? Why would people do the things they do? Uh, why, who, who would kill some little three-year-old? I mean, find her in a trash can. What? Broken people. But why would people want to be a boy and then a girl? And then, uh, broken people. Yeah. Twisted minds. Because of sin. There's an insanity that comes in sin. So, can our nation be restored? We can hope in God's promise right here, a healing of our land. So what is a biblical revival? Is it a series of meetings like we had this week that's hosted at a church? Is it an emphasis on prayer? Is revival just preaching or services? Can it be scheduled? The last time we had a revival, the answer to those questions is no, by the way. The last time we had a revival on American soil was 1857 to 59. It was a revival known as the Prayer Revival. It began with some men, six men to be exact, on Fulton Street in New York City. Six men met at lunch hour and began to pray. That's it. That noonday prayer meeting started to spread until that old Dutch Reformed church building could no longer hold the people. And it spread. And it went to other places and around the city and... Then it continued to spread until it crossed over across America and across into England. They said within two years, more than one million people have been saved as a result of this movement of prayer. Revival came. When will be the next time we have revival in American soil? I'm going to tell you, we won't have revival our way. The only way we have real revival, Holy Spirit revival, biblical revival, is that we'll have it God's way. And God gives these truths here. That's what we need, revival God's way. Oh, may the Lord help us.